All right, Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do something just uh, real simple today, but we're going to try and cover it real good, all right? All right, before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to study your word today. And we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. If there are any that have not trusted your son and his sacrifice as their means of salvation, we pray that you put it on their heart today. Open their ears, open their eyes, and let them see the simplicity of the gospel. It's not of works, it's by grace. In Christ's name and for his glory, amen. amen. All right, we're going to start in Galatians 3, and we're just going to read down from verse uh, 10. Galatians 3.10. Now remember the book of Galatians is all about uh, people that had trusted Christ and then someone had begun to put them under the law. I'll find it. I'll find it. I got it. I got it. In Galatians 3.10 he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now when it says the works of the <coughs> law, what law is it talking about? Moses. Moses' law. In other words, we just say the Ten Commandments, right? That sums up Moses' law, the Ten Commandments. Now I bet everybody in here has spent a large portion of your younger life for sure trying to be uh, right with God by keeping the commandments. Okay? Everybody's tried that? Okay. How many people have been able to do it? No. No, I fail miserably. Fail miserably. Has there ever been a person that uh, impressed God with their mode of living? Jesus. Jesus Christ, that's right. So he says, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now this is a fact. You can't try and get to God through the law without suffering the repercussions of the law. If you enter into a contract, you know... I've, I've told y'all many times I had a friend that was in the car business a bunch of years and he had the funniest stories about things people say when they're buying a car. All they know is they want that car and they want it right then and they don't even bother reading the fine print. He had a guy one time, he, he showed him, he said, okay, here it is. And said the guy looked at the paperwork and he said, what's the payment? And he said he showed him and the guy said, well, what does it come to with the late charges? This is at the loan table buying the car. He's already asking about the late. What did the man know? He's going to be late. He's going to be late, right? All right. Next guy, he said another time, he said he slid the paperwork over there. and said a guy looked at it and he said, well, I'll try it for a little while. <laughs> so, see, that's the attitude of the person that knows they're not going to live up to the demands of the contract, right? Well, if you want to get to God through your works, you're in the same position. You try it for a little while, but it ain't ever going to work. What did the fine print of the law say? Cursed is the man that doesn't keep all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, how many is all? All. All. Okay. All of them. Now, the reason it's a curse. Now, let's take this. We're just going to go back and forth. Y'all hold Galatians and get James chapter 2. About six books from the end. James chapter 2. Chapter 2, uh, i tell you what, he says, uh, well, we'll read from verse, uh, let's read verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Now Jesus said you could sum up all the law in two. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody in here claim you love God with all your heart? In this class one time, when you said that, I raised my hand <laughs> like a fool. It was a lot of thought, and I realized that you went ahead. And, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we think that at times, don't we? Look, you know where we're taught to think that at? In churches. Churches teach people that you're a good person, you're doing this, you're doing I don't mean all of them, but I mean religiously speaking. Who in here from the time you were little knew that you were naughty? We all know that, don't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, we know when we're young that we do not always obey. And there's repercussions for not obeying. Well, there's repercussions for not obeying God. And guess how many times you have to disobey to suffer the repercussions? Once. Then what are we all in danger of? We're guilty and we're in danger of repercussions. Now, again, watch what he says next. 
Alright, so we've just admitted that we don't love God with all our heart. Well, we certainly don't love our neighbor as ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you loved your neighbor the exact same amount that you loved yourself, would you want anything your neighbor couldn't have? Would you do anything looking out for number one without looking towards your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Now remember, he, the new covenant is in order that a man can begin to do these things through the power of God. If you sit here and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you still look at your neighbor, your brother or sister in Christ like, well, let me see what I can get out of him. I'd be in serious, uh, I'd, be, I'd go home and I'd seriously contemplate what it was I believed. If you look at a brother or sister in Christ like, ooh, let me see what I can use them for. You, you've got some serious problems. You need to go to the Lord with that. But as far as doing this thing to get to God, you can't do it. Now watch verse 9. But if you have respect to person, who's the main person a human being has respect to? Themselves. If you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. Does that make us a transgressor? Yes. Next verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, so if you want to work your way, turn back to Galatians. If you want to work your way into heaven, I'm going to put a timeline up here on the board. And we're going to go all the way back here to Adam. Alright, Adam was created, but Adam was not in a righteous man, and he wasn't in heaven. He was on this earth, wasn't he? If Adam wanted to spend eternity with God, there's two ways that Adam's going to be able to do that. Okay? He can either do it by his works. And the Bible says he could do it by his works. And what would his works need to be? Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. The first time he disobeys God, guess what? Done. He's done. He's disqualified. Mm -hmm. Did he disobey God? Yes. Immediately disqualified. And what God say would be the result? Death. He's dead and gone. <coughs> now, when you first hear that, my first thought is like, uh-oh. I mean, I'm in trouble here, right? But God told him when he disobeyed, he would die. But what did God do next? He killed an animal in his place. He killed an animal and he clothed him in the animal. In other words, he identified him and he wrapped him in the sacrifice. What was that animal? It was a type of Christ. It was his substitute. So then Adam, who went to God in his flesh, and his f flesh failed, didn't it? God then wraps him in a sacrifice. So there's Adam's work, and there's God's work. And those are the two means of coming to God. Has there ever been a human being that got to God through his works? No, no, no. You really think you're so special that you're going to get it done? Mm -hmm. Ain't that kind of how we believe when we're younger? Well, he didn't do it, but I'll get it done. Mm -hmm. nah. So we come over here to the cross. Put the cross right here. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, did God allow his son to become the substitute for the whole entire human race? Yes, he yeah. did. Okay. And what must a person do to be saved? Believe. They must believe, they must be spiritually identified, they must be wrapped in the sacrifice. How do you put His sacrifice to your account? I believe it. You believe it. God wraps you in it. Adam didn't go say, God, would you kill some animals for me? Adam didn't even go to God. God called Adam. God brought Adam out. God accused Adam. God found Adam guilty. God rebuked Adam. And then what did God do? God saved Adam by shedding innocent blood. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The blood's already been shed. The sacrifice is already there. All we've got to do over here 2,000 years later is just say, well, then that is my sacrifice. So then over here today, my works have failed just like Adam's, but God's work has never failed. And where was God's work manifest to mankind? Right there at that cross of Calvary. Okay, now he says back in Galatians, <clears throat> verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written in the law. Here's the fine print in the law. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if I want to work my way to God, did he give me some guidelines? 
Yeah. Here's the law. Do it. And what happens if I enter into that contract in my mind, okay, I'm going to do it and I fail one time. No. I'm cursed. I'm guilty and I'm cursed. You know, that's actually the whole point of the law. To make us guilty and to see we're cursed? Mm -hmm. Does the person that thinks they're okay ever go to the Lord in faith? Mm -hmm. That person can't come to the Lord. If they've never seen what they are, the Lord ain't never called them. Now, in order for Adam to uh, be called of God, what was the first thing before God ever called Adam? As soon as Adam disobeyed, what was the first thing Adam noticed? Naked. He was, he was naked. naked. Now, I don't doubt he was physically naked, but that ain't the issue. The issue is what that clothing represents. In the Bible, it represents righteousness. He was covered in God's light, so to speak, and then what happened? Darkness entered in. Folks, he saw himself in a different light. You ever, you know, you grow up and you see yourself one way and all of a sudden something happens and you see yourself a little different way, don't you? He, when Lexi used to keep Wyatt, it, I used to watch, she put that little blue swimming pool she had for him in the front yard. He wasn't even two. And when he saw that swimming pool, he'd start peeling his clothes off. He would get butt naked out in the front yard, people driving by, he didn't care. Why? Because he was innocent. He was innocent. He wasn't aware. All of a sudden, I don't remember what age, but all of a sudden there just comes a day when all that changes. You now see that there's shame in that, don't you? Adam now saw shame in his condition because of his disobedience to God. Then guess what? Adam's sins had done their job, haven't they? Adam's sins showed him his desperate need of God. And then what did God do? He called him. Now, how does God call today? Look, there's Adam back there. We'll just come over here. All right, we're going to put, here's Chris over here. Is Chris any different than Adam? No. Exact, worse. Exact, worse, okay. <laughs> exact same in the flesh, right? Chris, did you try to do the good works they told you? Oh, gosh, yes. Me and Chris was raised in the same religion. They had an entire system of works, didn't they? And it had all its fine print and all that too. And the fine print there involved money every time. But <clears throat> you try these works and what happens with your works is they fail, don't they? After seeing your failure and knowing, I'm in trouble here. I'm on, I'm on a road to, I mean, I'm in serious trouble. I'm heading to hell. I'm heading to destruction. At best, in our case, we're heading to the halfway house. Right? But then what happens? God steps in and calls you. And God is going to begin His call in you. I'll put up here God's work. God's work starts with a call, doesn't it? And how does God call today? By the gospel. Yeah, the gospel means the good news. What is the good news talking about? The cross. The cross. The free gift. The grace of God that allowed him to give his only son to die in your place. And immediately something happens when that call is issued. This person is now in a position where they have a, can have a real relationship with God, can't they? Could they have that before that moment? Yeah. It's impossible. It's like inviting yourself to a party. I had a friend growing up and he'd always say, where y'all going? Oh, well, good, I'll go too. And I'd always think, nobody invited you. <laughs> you know, we all got friends like that, right? <laughs> My mom had a friend that she'd call and say, what'd you cook for dinner? My mom would tell her and she'd say, well, good, I'll be over there in a minute. <laughs> and just, you know, that kind of attitude, right? You can't do that with God. You can't go to God and say, Lord, I've been looking for you and I've decided that no. The Bible says no man seeks after God. I'm going to prove it to you. What did Adam do when he saw he was in trouble? He went to work to cover himself up and he hid in the bushes. There's what we do with our sins. We hide them. We cover them up. We try and do something to lessen the blow. And why are we doing that? Because we love God? We love ourselves. We don't like to be seen in the true light. I'm going to tell you all the best analogy to a human being, in my opinion, is a cockroach. Cockroaches, you come in, they're all at work. You turn on the lights, and what do they all do? They scatter. they scatter. You shine the light on a center where others can see what they're doing and thinking, and what do they want to do? Right. You want to run and hide. That's a human's nature, and that's what Adam did. <laughs> now, God made coats of skins and clothed Adam. What did God say? 
He sends the call out, which is about the cross. And if the person will believe that Jesus Christ was their sacrifice, not for y'all's sin, for my sin, God said, if you will believe that, and you will believe that He died and was buried, and that God did away with the penalty of your sin and raised Christ from the dead, if you will believe those small facts, God will reciprocate with what? Putting righteousness to your account. God made coats of skins. Look, God called Adam. Where art thou, Adam? And then God made coats of skins. And what did He do? He clothed Adam. Who did all the work? God. God. Who did it all over here? God. God. It's Jesus Christ. And that's how a person gets saved. A person gets saved by denying their works are going to do anything for them. you got to see, hey, I'm lost here. I'm hiding in the bushes, heading to hell. And unless God sheds blood on my behalf, I'm in trouble. And find out God did shed blood on my behalf. God did it all. Now he says again, uh, <clears throat> verse, uh, not, Cursed is the one that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified. Now let's talk about justified for a minute. That's a legal term. Justified does not mean cleared. They don't mean cleared at all. What does justified mean? Just you mean, as if you've never sinned. Yeah, just as if you've never sinned and never been guilty. Huh? Even. Even. Justified is put back in complete right standing <clears throat> with God. Mm -hmm. Now a person that has ever offended God cannot claim that. Alright, if I go down to, if I commit a murder and I get pardoned, right? What does pardoned mean? Great. I've been set free for the rest of my look. I don't. I I don't think of. All right, well you got somebody, let's say, murdered someone, and the entire world knows the person murdered them, but they get off on a technicality or the a, a mistrial, something like that. For the rest of that person's life, every time you see them, what do you think? Okay. Yeah. 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 There's the guy that murdered and got away with it, right? Has that person been justified? Yeah. No, that person's guilty. He just didn't suffer the penalty. Right. Okay? Now, can anyone that's saved claim that they have been pardoned in that manner? Yes. Oh, no. No way. No way. Why not, Mr. Al? Because I've been justified. You've been justified. Pardoned is the man is doesn't pay the penalty and the crime goes unpunished. Justified is someone else takes the punishment for you and it's as if you had never committed the crime. We did not get pardoned alone. We got the grace of God. Jesus Christ died for us. How in the world could Jesus Christ die for us? How could God legally have His Son die in the place of rotten sinners? He just said it. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Go take whole Galatians and go all the way back to the uh, fifth book from the front. Deuteronomy 21. You talk about fine print in a contract. Boy, here's some the best example of fine print in the entire history of mankind. Here it comes. This is the fine print of the law contract. Okay? <clears throat> Y'all know uh, a person signed something. Y'all remember... They don't have it anymore. When I was coming up, you got everybody had the TV guide, right? And in the TV guide, you had the Columbia uh, Record Club, right? Remember the Columbia? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it had a big ad, right? And the ad said, it said get 12 uh, tape cassettes. 12 cassettes for a penny. Eight tracks. Eight tracks, okay. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it was cassettes. <laughs> so, 12 of them for a penny. Now that's the that's the bold print, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How many people jumped on that? A lot. Yeah. Twice. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but what did the fine print say? You locked it for a year. You got it for a year. You're obligated to buy however many more at like fourteen ninety five a piece when a cassette was six dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So we all understand about the fine print. It looks real good when you're wanting something, but we really don't think about the repercussions, do we? Now, y'all think about a little kid, because this is what we act like. You tell a little kid, he says, I want a candy bar. I say, well, I'll give it to you, but you got to cut the grass when we get home. 
that kid don't think about the cutting of the grass. He's got his eyes on the candy bar. Done. Okay, I'll do it. Later, he thinks of, oh, why did I agree to this, right? Israel entered in. They saw the promises of the law. The law talked about all these wonderful blessings that God would give them if they kept the law perfectly, right? It's as if a man came along and said, look, I want to propose to you ladies. I've got a mansion and I'm worth a hundred million and I'll give you half of all I've got. In fact, I'll give you all I've got. I'll shower you with roses every day. I'll love you in a way that you can't possibly imagine. I'll give you the best of everything. You'll be the queen of all the earth if you'll just be absolutely perfect. <laughs> Y'all hear that last little part? Yeah. What does what would the woman hear? I, if it were me, I'd hear the hundred billion, the queen, the hot right, <laughs> fine food. Ain't that how we focus on it, isn't it? What did Israel see? The blessings. In that same contract, he said, but big word, isn't it? If you obey not all these things, then I will curse you. Cursed will be your cattle. Cursed will be your children. He went on talking about all the curses, didn't he? And what would bring on the curse? Imperfection. And what is every human being? Imperfect. Imperfect. But God had a clause in that contract. Thank God for the infinite mercy and long-suffering of God. Watch the clause in that contract. Verse 22 of Deuteronomy 21. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, have you? Yep. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, doesn't it? Yep. How about what's the what's the penalty for murder? Death. Yep. Somebody said, I've never <coughs> murdered anyone. Jesus said, if you've had hatred in your heart, you've murdered. What keeps us from murdering out on Airport Boulevard? Fear of getting caught. Fear of getting caught. Anybody ever wanted to choke somebody on Cottage Hill Road? <laughs> you drove on Cottage Hill Road, you, that's how we feel. It. Before you can think about it, you're ready to get, aren't you? Alright, so he says, If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, thou hang him on a tree. How are you going to have to kill him? Hang him on, hang him on a tree. <coughs> he says, 23, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, as a key to why they're in such a hurry to get Jesus off the cross is partly because this had to be fulfilled. They didn't know it. He said, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. So the person, if I was a Jew 3,500 years ago, and I come walking down the road, and I look up, and there's a man hanging on a tree, what would I think? He's guilty. Guilty criminal. There's a criminal that suffered the curse of the law, right? He, we watched that Game of Thrones. Remember they hung all those people on the... Up 60 miles out of town, they got to town and they started seeing people hanging on them crawl. What did that say to the people? They, 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 they've been found. Something's going on, right? So if a Jew saw a man hanging on a tree, he said that man has suffered the curse of Moses' law. Right? Where did Jesus Christ die at? On a tree. What did that say to the Jew? That's a cursed criminal. There's a lawbreaker. Now, when they made this cross, they made three of them, didn't they? Look, they didn't make them that morning. They, they're prepared. They've already tried these other three characters, haven't they? These other three are called uh, thieves, malefactors, murderers, right? Did those three men deserve to die? Yeah. yeah they deserved the death penalty, didn't they? And yet that day, they rushed Jesus Christ through the night and end up through a kangaroo trial early in the morning. They bring him out here and they're going to hang him on this cross. And Pontius Pilate says, well, this man hath done nothing wrong. He declares him to be innocent, doesn't he? Had Jesus Christ in his 33 and a half years ever broken the law? No. So during 33 and a half years... He kept the law perfectly, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So then was it could how could God possibly curse him? Our sin. It's it's us. us. But God can't curse him and be unrighteous and break his own law, can he? Mm -hmm. So what did Christ do? He hung on a tree. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Mm -hmm. There was no legal right to justify Jesus Christ under or to uh, crucify him under the law except right there mm -hmm. 
Did Jesus Christ willingly die on the tree? Yes. And so what did he become to everyone? Curse. A curse. Because they hung him on the tree, wouldn't that mean that he still didn't transgress the law? The people who hung him up there. Yeah, they did. The it's exactly right. But he died a criminal's death. He died a criminal's death. Now, he George brings up something very interesting. I heard an old fellow say one time, he said, there's a, a thousand ways to die, right? There are. There's a thousand ways to commit suicide, isn't there? Crucify yourself. <laughs> Can't be done. It cannot be done. I can cut my own throat. I can shoot myself. I can drown myself. Crucify yourself. How are you going to do it? You can't. If I reach over and I nail this hand in a tree, then what? I'm going to hang up there on Game of Thrones. They hung up there like that, didn't it? You can't crucify yourself, can you? What does that tell us? Only Jesus. Only Jesus Christ can be crucified. And also, after salvation, who's the only one that can put your flesh to death? Christ, the Lord. Sanctification is of the Lord, isn't it? Now, in this crucifixion... <clears throat> As they crucified Jesus Christ, an innocent man is now marked as a curse, isn't he? So he is innocent, and yet there he is on the tree. That's perfectly legal under the law for God now to see him as our substitute, isn't it? So he hangs on that tree. He completely pays the curse for the law. The law is fulfilled. The law is nailed to the cross. And Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. None. Right? Now, Barabbas, the, the ringleader of the thieves, he was supposed to hang on that cross, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Barabbas was a murderer and a male factor and a thief. And yet Pontius Pilate said that day, it was a, it was a feast day, he said, Look, y'all have a custom that we let someone go free today. Shall we let this Jesus go free who has done nothing wrong? And what did the people say? Mm -hmm. oh. Let Barabbas go. The people hated Jesus Christ so much that they would rather have a man that had been stealing and looting and pillaging their houses and murdering their family members go free instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And i got news for y'all. My flesh and your flesh is just as opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ as that. We are just as of a shame in our flesh of that cross. You and I are Barabbas. Did Christ suffer in Barabbas' place? Yes. yes. Did he suffer in your place? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then what does that make you and I? Barabbas. We're Barabbas. We are the criminals. What does a criminal do? He breaks the law. How many times do you have to break God's law to be a criminal? Twice. And he broke it? Yes. Yeah. Then we're criminals, aren't we? Then are we worthy of death? Yes. We are. And who died in our place? Jesus Christ. The Lord said that if you and I would just admit what we are. Now I'm not even talking about some public, big, broad public confession. Look, that, that can be done. That's a bunch of foolishness. Right. What I'm talking about is admit it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Look in the mirror and see something in that mirror and say, hey, there's the criminal right there. There's the one that crucified my Savior. I am a sinner by birth, and I'm not proud of it, but I have been a sinner by choice. Now, how could I declare myself innocent when I just admitted my own guilt? The moment I'll admit my own guilt, what will God do? He'll call you. Call you by the cross. And tell you about the substitute who died in your place. How can an innocent man believe someone died in their place? Can't. You can. It's impossible. Folks, how could I believe, how could an innocent person believe someone else suffered for my crimes? They didn't need a savior. They don't need a savior. An innocent person isn't guilty. An innocent person doesn't fear retribution. An innocent person's not guilty before God. Find me an innocent, self-righteous person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. You find a bunch of them that run around talking about His name. Like you can't crucify yourself. People today want to run around acting crucified in the Lord, don't they? Look how holy I live. I have quit this and I gave up that and look what I'm doing for the Lord. You know, they can nail this hand to the cross, but they can't nail that one because without this one, they couldn't hold the megaphone to announce what all they've been doing for the Lord. <laughs> now, that's, that's, that's the backwards that's end, isn't it? Okay. So when Barabbas dies on that cross, or when Jesus dies on that cross, he's dying for Barabbas, and Barabbas represents us, doesn't he? Okay. Let's go back over to Galatians. Verse 
verse 11 again, Galatians 3.11, he says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. You know what that contract that said that required death? The just shall live by faith. Imagine you go to buy a car, and in the fine print it says if you're one day late on that car, they're going to come take it, right? If you make a payment late. And you make a payment late, and they come to get your car. And you fight and argue over and on, and finally you just keep looking at the contract, and you want to fight and say this ain't fair, no, but deep down inside you know that's what it says. And along comes uh, some... <coughs> The Alabama hammer comes along, right? <laughs> and the Alabama hammer says, wait a minute. There's another clause buried deep in the contract. You haven't seen it, but it's in there. The human eye won't catch it. He said, but I'm the one that drew up the contract for this car dealership, and I know it's in there. I put it in there on purpose. And I said, well, what are you talking about? This says, and he said, yeah, it says that, but look what it says under here. The man that just believes the car payments made can keep his car. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, do you believe someone else paid for your car? And I said, well, no, nobody else going to pay for my car. And he said, all right, haul it off. <laughs> and he said, now, do you? And I said, no. Well, it comes along Mr. Al to get Mr. Al's car. And he said, look, I'm the one that drew up the contract. Look what it says here. If I will believe the payment has been made, then the payment's made. And Mr. Al says, well, it says it in the contract. I don't know how anyone could be that gracious, but it says it right there. And I've got a contract. I demand that's it. And guess what? They pack up and they leave. And Mr. Al's car sits in the driveway. There was a clause in the law that says, the just shall live by faith. What did David say? A man born under the law. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. Impute means charge your account. Did the law always have in it, hidden in it, the fact that God was going to save men by grace through faith? Absolutely. It did. Did the Jews ever see that? It had to be revealed, didn't it? Now watch Paul say next. Verse 12. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Look, the law has nothing to do with faith. If I say I did something work so God can save me, then God has got to save me and cannot withhold salvation from me. If I did the work and God doesn't pay me, it makes God a crook, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But has anybody ever done the work? Mm -hmm. And God don't owe anybody payment, does he? But what about a gift? How do you get a gift? Somebody gives you, Somebody gives you a gift. And let's say someone gives you a gift. Mr. Al comes walking in today and he tosses me the keys to a brand new Mercedes. I catch the keys. I said, what is this? He said, it's a Mercedes, whatever, parked out in the driveway. I bought it. It's paid for. The title's in the glove compartment in your name. And I look at it and I said, no, nah, I don't believe that. I throw him the keys back. <laughs> is the car in my name? Mm, yes. Am I ever going to enjoy it? No. Will I ever possess it? No. Will it ever become mine between my ears? No. So I'm going to live without that car, ain't I? What about Mr. Al throws me the keys of that and I see it and I see the value and I want it, but I don't want to be beholden to Mr. Al. So I reach in my pocket and I pull out a 20 and I give it to Mr. Al and say, let's call it even. <laughs> 20 for a new Mercedes. What would that do to Mr. Al? You talk about an insult. What does Mr. Al want me to do? To accept it and Accept it and thank him. And every time I run into him or even think about him, what does he want me to do? Thank you. Who did all the work? Mr. Al. Who paid all the payments? Mr. Al. What did I do? Accept it. I believed his graciousness. Now, if somebody made that gift to us today, we'd say, nobody's that gracious. What's the catch? Did Jesus Christ give the free gift of salvation to all who would believe? Yes. If you'll just right now this morning, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved you right there where you're sitting. There's nowhere for you to go, and there's nothing for you to join in this book. There is no such thing as a sinner's prayer or walk the aisle. Men made up all of that to get credit. Remember the megaphone yeah. hollering? That's all about that. What Jesus Christ desires you to do right now today is to quit believing on you and believe on Him. Now, that's what must be done. So he says, verse 13, <coughs> Christ hath redeemed us 
from the curse of the law. Notice hath redeemed is past tense, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Folks, he didn't just uh, tear the law up. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled the contract by payment, didn't he? Look, he didn't go down to the car dealership at night and steal your contract out of the filing cabinet and tear it up where it can't be found. That's not, that's not legal. He went down there and paid the thing off in full and presented you with the paperwork. What would you have to do to get it? Accept it. you got to accept you got to believe it. He said, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That... Now here's the reason that he did it. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Now what are you? Gentiles. Gentiles. We're Gentiles. Might come on the Gentiles <coughs> through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through <coughs> faith. Through works or through faith? faith? Faith. So did Jesus Christ die in order that he could save all men by faith? Yes, sir. So what would be keeping you from getting saved this morning? Yourself. Unbelief. Lack of faith. That's it. People have been told, oh no, you've got to quit this, this, and this. Well, I believe we ought to quit a bunch of things that we do. We ought to start doing a bunch of things that we don't do. It ain't got nothing to do with salvation. How are you going to tell a man that is completely impotent to do anything? When I say impotent, I mean no power. That person can't do anything. Mm -hmm. These people that run around preaching this mode of repentance today to get saved are telling people to do things that they couldn't do before salvation anyway. Right. How in the world are you going to tell a person that has no life in them to show forth the life of Christ? It can't be done, can it? So then what comes first? Chicken or the egg? Somebody had, was using that as an analogy the other day, and a friend of mine in the... Uh, uh, James out in uh, Arizona said, well, I, the Bible answers that in chapter 1. Mm -hmm. I know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Did God create the egg or the chicken? Yeah, yeah. The chicken. The chicken came first, right. didn't it? So then what comes first? The thing that produces the egg or the egg that produces the thing? The thing, the thing that produces, that produces the, egg. the egg. How did eternal life come? Through Jesus Christ, the creator of all things. What did he make possible? Life. Life comes by Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then anything I could do that would be considered alive in God, I can't do it without first having Christ. Can I? No. Can I mean, y'all think about how can an egg exist without a chicken? Yeah, it, can. it won't happen. So then we turn around and we take all this and we bring it over again, almost 2,000 years later, to Chris. Chris tried all of his life to do everything he could to get right with God. I mean, he tried everything. Chris told me about going to the mountains in South America trying to get right with God. Did it ever work? No. Nope. So what finally happens is that person finally gets to a point where they begin to reckon with themselves in an honest manner. What does that mean? Take account of yourself. Mm -hmm. When you take account of yourself, what do you see? It's always tough. It's tough. We don't like doing this, do we? Take account of yourself and what do you see? Bad things. see you see a dead sinner. You see a criminal worthy of hanging on that tree. Mm -hmm. Once you see that, once Chris came to a point, look, he always knew his guilt or he would have been trying to get right with God. He had to see his complete inability to get right with God. Once he saw his complete inability to fix his situation, then somebody told him about the fix. Right? Yeah, I was the one that uh, got to Chris through here. Now, how did this happen? Maddie and Al. Maddie and Al, okay. Look, this is how this is works. Y'all, everybody knows what a pyramid uh, business is, right? You go in a pyramid business and you can say, well, this person came through this person, came through that person, came through that person. Well, I got new salvation. I, hate, I don't say Jesus is a crook by any means, but salvation is by word of mouth. That's why pyramid businesses are set up that way. No better form of advertising than word of mouth, is there? Well, who told Chris about the good news? Mm -hmm. oh. You say, well, no, it was a man Al introduced him to. That, who, who was speaking the words ain't the issue. How did life pass from Christ to Chris? It went through Al. How does every fruit come into the world? Hearing. Through the roots, through the trunk, through the, right? It's the hearing of faith. So Jesus Christ did the work, and finally when Chris saw, I can't do it, 
he heard about the work. And then what happened? Around it comes, doesn't it? He, we sit here, look, we got, uh, okay, we got a uh, young lady over here that I've never met before, right? What's she doing here? She heard, she heard something from Chris. You say, no, she heard from her dad, or her dad heard it from Chris. You say, well, that Chris is a special guy. No, we don't prove Chris is a rotten sinner. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, does that make sense? Yes. So then Paul says in 2 uh, Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. If I had a big thing of that, uh, what's some great special drink? Uh, just the Bush best. Wiper. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I had a big pitcher of just the most wonderful cold spring water up here, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody comes up here with their cup. I fill up a gallon and I send it over to Chris's house. Chris takes the gallon and pours it in the cups in his house and they drink it, don't they? Wendell gets a cup and fills up a big jug of it and he takes But where's it all coming from? The source. Is the, is the containers the good thing or is no, it the water that's the water good? Is what does every vessel that's saved, every fleshly vessel that's saved, is the vessel special? No. Something was placed in that vessel, wasn't it? What? Christ. How does Christ get placed in your vessel to start? You hear words. You hear, hey, He takes up residence in your mind. You used to could say, Chris, are you going to heaven? And He'd immediately think about His works. I mean, immediately somebody said, are you, what's going to happen when you die? You didn't think about Christ. You immediately thought about your performance. And you'd say things like, well, I hope so. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm trying. Or, you know, I, I pray so. Well, guess what? Ask me if I'm going to heaven. Yes, I'm going to heaven. Absolutely, Absolutely. I, I can't be kept out. Absolutely. Well, why can you not be kept out? You're special. Oh, no. no. No, no, no. I'm not special. God said so. He said if I would believe on His Son, He would let me in. And God can't lie. I've got Jesus Christ. When you ask me if I'm saved, the first thought that pops in my forehead ain't Troy. It's Jesus Christ. He's the seed, isn't He? See how that works? Now there are people you say, are you saved? And the first thing that pops in their mind is Christ and me. In other words, they see this wonderful partnership whereby they did their part and Christ did His part and the two parts came together and created what God saw as fit. Is that how it worked? No. Nope. You got any part in the work? No. Nope. All you can do is believe on it. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, let's look at one more uh, thing here real quick. <clears throat> Take uh, what he just said about the righteousness and go back to Romans 3. Go two books back to the left. Romans 3.21 After just saying that Moses' law had, had been given just to declare guilt and that it stopped, in verse 21, Paul says, But not the righteousness of God. Now that's the requirement to get into God's presence. His righteousness. If He is the possessor of it, where are you going to get it from? Yeah. Him. you got to go to the source, don't you? Can I get His righteousness from Chris? Nope. No. Chris has got to get his righteousness from God. I've got to get my righteousness from God. I can hear about it through Chris, but where do I get it from? It's still coming from God. It's got to come from God. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Yeah. You know what's amazing? The Jews looked at the law and they missed what the law really said, and Paul went out with the law and preached salvation by grace. And the Jews said, no, 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 the law says works. And Paul said, you better look closer. The law says the just shall live by faith. They said, no, the law said it's, it's a curse is on the person that don't do these things. He said, you better look deeper. The law says Christ is the curse for you. Who was the real expert on the legal contract? Well, folks, the Apostle Paul was as good as any man. But who actually wrote the contract? Jesus Christ. You know the guy that wrote the, uh, I was watched this guy interviewed one time, he wrote the health care bill when, uh, when President Obama got elected. Within just a week or so, they already had an 1,100 page health bill all right. You know what the man that wrote it said? He wrote it. Y'all heard what he said, didn't you? What was the key to getting that law passed? 
Hi, you got to make it so big and so oh, yeah. fast and make it in such language That's where nobody right. can understand it. Who in here believes that those senators sat down and read an 1,100-page bill? I doubt they've ever read a single bill. We'll read it and tell you what it says. Yeah, we'll read it and tell you what it says. That's Okay, now look, I'm not picking on anybody's political opinion. I don't mean that at all. They're all crooks, okay? Both sides of the aisle, they're all crooks out there. But, yeah, they're doing the same thing. It's nothing's any different, okay? Now, let's talk about that health care law. What was actually in there? Now you're starting to find out, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Now you're starting to find out. Someone says, well, President Obama did. No, he didn't. Well, the Democrats said, no, they didn't. Who actually wrote that health care law? Okay, insurance the insurance and the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And now the insurance companies are acting like they're going broke. No, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. they've, they've got legal means to deny people now. That's, That's right. what they've got. So then, did they have did they have a course of action in mind? Sure. All they did was use a group of men to get what they wanted, right? Mm -hmm. But now they've got it in writing, don't they? Yep. Who wrote the law of Moses? Christ. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Did he have a course of action in mind? Yes. Yeah. Did he know exactly what he intended to do? Yeah. But was it hidden in there in the fine yeah. print? What did he actually intend to do from the beginning? on the cross. Guess what? He wrote it in such a way where he had legal, just means to get on that cross and die. Everything about it is perfect and just. It, it's absolutely accomplishing exactly what it was supposed to accomplish. Does that make sense? Okay, now, he says in Romans 3.22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Alright, does everybody see the no difference? There is no difference, all are pretty good people. Doesn't say that, does it? Does it say there is no difference, there's a little good in everyone? It says there is no difference, what? All have sinned. All have sinned and come short of God. All right. If I have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and come is present tense, I continue to come in my flesh short of the glory of God, then what must I admit about myself? A I'm a failure. Thank God there was some stuff written in there in the fine print that Jesus Christ was the object of the law, wasn't he? Yeah. he you know, I, don't, I suspect any law you ever find anywhere, you go back and you'll find out that the re, you, these laws are written out were written out not for the purpose of what the law says, but for some man's purpose in writing the laws. Y'all, we all know how this works. That's how all of them do. And like right now, they're fighting over another health care bill. Guarantee you, they get this one passed. You'll find out it ain't gonna be any better than the one they got, but it'll just benefit a different group of people in a different manner, if not the same people. Anything that men do, what is always the source? Covetousness. Yeah. You know what, George? Just what you just said. Verse 20 and 21 shows that this is of God and not of a man. Because you look at this and it looks like the law and the prophet brought the charges and then they got on the defense stand and witness for the defense. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what God intended, isn't it? Okay? When a law is passed today, I guarantee you that law is intended to do something that people don't really understand. He, they passed the law a while back that, uh, that people could have cell phones for free. Everybody had a right to a cell phone. Do y'all know who became the richest man in the world within like six months? That Mexican guy that owned all the cell phone companies. Check it out. Who y'all reckon promoted that law? A Mexican guy. What put that law into effect? Covetousness. What made it operate? Covetousness. Y'all ever see, I see people all the time walking around. I go to the nursing home and I kid you all not, I pass by rooms and everybody's got two cell phones oh, yeah. walking around with them. I'm like, what do you need two cell phones for? Is one business and one's personal? No, no, no. This is my phone and this is my free phone. Right. Well, how's that work? Covetousness. You see how simple that is? All right. Why did the law get signed into effect on account of the Jews? Covetousness. What did they see? All the blessings. They said, look at what we can get. And what did they never see? What Christ was going to have to suffer. That was the point of the law all along. The law did exactly what it was intended to do. It brought guilt. And who suffered the guilt? 
Christ suffered on behalf of all mankind right there for us, didn't He? Yes, he now, did. if you're over here today and you currently are kind of indifferent about this, think, oh, I'm just sick of hearing about this stuff or whatever. What are you actually flaunt, flaunting at? The death of God. Folks, you're, you're turning your nose up at the death of God. You think He's going to hold you guiltless when you stand before Him? No. You're going to stand before Him. I said, well, if I stand before him, he can do whatever he wants. I don't care. I'll be dead. Well, you better inspect that statement pretty good. So then, do you want to stand before the God that died for you and tell him, I wasn't real concerned the day that I heard you died for me? Accept the free gift. That's, that's the sin. It's unbelief. It's the sin of unbelief. Yeah. Folks, there's nothing more hate. There's no more hatred in the world than love spurned. Who makes the worst enemy in the world? Scorn one. Scorn Ex-wife, right? Or an ex. Y'all know how that works. He, you see two people in a relationship, and there's love, right? And then when they, it's it, it's because it's such a strong emotion. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. For God so hated sin, He gave His only begotten Son. For God so loved faith. He would save me. For God so hated unbelief, He will condemn me. Yes. you got to have both sides of the coin. Don't leave here today not believing on the Lord. I mean, this is crazy. You don't know if you got tomorrow. You might walk out in the road and get run over by a herd of cats. You have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> That's possible here. Okay, so y'all just take a break. Let's take a break.